This is the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show, Series 7, Episode 25, Energy Levels. Coming up on this week's Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show, we talk about energy levels, how to get them up to the pre-season excitement and keep them there even as the long season goes on. We also help players with passion. One player has a passion problem in that his parents don't want him to play even though he really wants to. And another player who is having trouble with his slow left arm spin bowling and bowling over the wicket. Find out more about that on this week's Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show. Welcome to the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show. This is your guide to better cricket and um, it doesn't matter where you are or who you are. We are here to help you out for the next half an hour or so. My name is David Hinchliffe. I look after things and helping me to help you are two very fine cricket coaches. The first of which is the cricket is the Director of Cricket Coaching at Millfield School. It's Mark Garraway. Hello, Garris. How are you all? OK. Very good, thank you. Yes, so you, uh, what, what's the cricket scene like with you at the moment? Is there still plenty going on? Uh, we've got plenty going on. Not so much here. I'm, I'm more remote. I'm actually in school today. I'm working with a couple of lads that are coming up to a school in uh, September. So doing some MOT checks with them. And then I'm at a cricket festival this afternoon. Uh, yesterday I went to watch the West of England play against uh, a Somerset side. Um, and also spoke to our three guys who were picked for England under-19s yesterday, which was really good to speak to them and congratulate yeah. them. And also... An Another lad that got into the development eleven that's going to play against Sri Lanka as well. So, four internationals in the same team was pretty pretty good effort. Yeah, that's great. Lots of talent on show. Lots of youngsters doing their thing. That's really good to see, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. You know, and they work so hard, and uh, I'm just I'm just really pleased. A couple of them, it's their first time in an England shirt as well. So, um, yeah, really pleased for them. Secondly, it's the cricket professional at Portsmouth Grammar School. It's Sam Lavery. Hello, Lavers. So, you uh, has has everything stopped now? Are you on full on full cricket break yet? Oh well, I'm almost there actually. It's almost. the last day will be today. Oh. Um, so uh, yeah, last last day at the grammar school today, and um, a few things to uh, to get done. There'll be a little bit of cricket over the next three weeks, which we we just try and uh, keep keep some options open for the boys because. Um, um, in contrast to, to Garras, where they're uh, they're all or they're largely borders, um, our, our boys are all local, so they're all within probably half an hour. So um, we do keep a few things going on, but it will uh, yeah it will be a, a, dra- a drastic reduction on the uh, the usual opportunities that we're uh, that we're given. So a little bit quieter, which would be very very nice. But um, yeah, looking forward to some uh, some uh, time time away and a bit of a break. Lovely, lots of DIY to do, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, it, it's an interesting time of year, actually, because um, it, something that has been on my mind, particularly uh, around sort of you know the, to, past the middle of the season, uh, but still a little way from the end of it, is that is the whole idea of energy levels and keeping people uh, interested and, and working hard and and keeping that energy level up, not only in terms of attending practice and um, working hard to improve, but but also just. More, more generally, the motivation to to have uh, cricket around at this time of year, because especially with the younger players, there's so much people could be doing. Um, but cricket is just one option among many, and so I guess keeping energy up when people are there is a really important part of that. And I was I wanted to get your thoughts on that, and um, uh, whether it's with younger players, you know, who maybe find that their attentions are spread elsewhere, or with with senior players who are finding it a long season. What what ways have you got, what tools have you got in your toolbox for, for helping keep energy levels up? Oh, well, I sort of go a little bit down the, the less is more route uh, occasionally just to, to keep it fresh. So I might, for example, have a shorter practice followed by uh, a social event or something at the cricket club rather than having a the normal length of, uh, of practice. I might even just say, OK, we're not going to do a, a practice at all today, just so when they come uh, round to that next game, they're hungry for it. Because I don't think we can get away from the fact that 
whether it's a child or whether it's an adult, the thing that they really live for is, is the game. Um, and, and often it's the commitment of the practice, particularly, as you say, when there's lots of things around for kids to do in the summer holidays, which, uh, which is the demotivator at times. So I think a less is more approach sometimes can be work, can work, you know, not for the whole summer, obviously, but certainly dropping in a week with a lower loading uh, and more emphasis on the game can sometimes keep those motivations up. And, and I don't think that's too different in this day and age where families are being stretched in this direction and that direction that we need to be uh, aware of that. I also think the other thing that we need to think about is, is doing some different format stuff. So, uh, you know, with kids being having so many things to do, uh, rather than losing them to the game, you know, can we put on a, uh, a different type of format which is more inclusive, which gives uh, more opportunity, which may be you know, uh, six aside, eight aside with barbecue going and whatever and trying to involve the family, I think is, is really important because uh, if we don't do that, then the summer holidays almost be, become a less cricket environment rather than a more cricket environment. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, what about you, Lavers? Do you find, I guess, uh, especially with guys, uh, schoolboys, that, that kind of age, where um, it's easy to get distracted, even in a, even in a within a session. Do you know what I mean? You can have guys who sort of lose lose interest a little bit, and then you're everybody starts spinning the wheels a little bit, even if they are at practice, do you know what I mean? So what what about motivating guys who maybe they, they, they manage to get to practice and they manage to get to games, but their heart's not in it? Do you, you must have seen that. Yeah, you do, you do get it from time to time. And, and they, um, I, I do I do kind of get your, um, your, uh, your idea here that younger guys probably do want a little bit more engagement and a little bit more... Um, a little bit more going on to keep them stimulated because that's, I guess that's the world they live in now. There's, there's a lot more options, a lot more things happening. Um, w- within sessions, I think it's, if we're going to try and um, try and get all these, all these players engaged and um, invested in what they're doing throughout a whole session and throughout a series of sessions, then it's pretty important that we do the same from, from a coaching point of view, from a, from a staff point of view. Um, and rather than one person taking the lead all the time and one person being the, the sole voice and, and, and the person that is there to motivate and, and the person that's there to direct, etc., then it, it's quite useful to kind of share that energy around as well. So um, if you divide a session up or a series of sessions up uh, amongst the two or three people you may have, if you're lucky enough to have more than one person who's, who's delivering, then that can be um, a really good way just to provide a different voice and a different focus for the attention um, because the same the same person over and over again can get a little bit a little bit repetitive but again sharing out the sessions and making sure that there are there are elements where there's real focus on development there's elements where it then re- relates back or directly into a game there are elements that are uh, completely player led um, and trying to have um, segments that are going to challenge the way players think in, in in slightly different ways which will in turn engage them but again all fall under this banner of improvement or development within cricket which is which is where we want to try and retain our focus as much as we can but yeah if we can if we can have different sections with that and different um different ways of engaging within that then hopefully we'll retain their attention a little bit a little bit more and we'll get a few more um a few more improvements and benefits from it yeah, it's it's um, it, it can be a challenge sometimes, can't it? Especially if you get uh, if you're in a situation where there's a range of abilities and a, a you know a larger number of people. Sometimes it, it you can um, you know you can get people with with high levels of interest and low levels of interest. And managing that is is a, is a tricky thing to do, isn't it, Gareth? Yeah, it is. As soon as you add numbers to it, but again, I think it comes down to making leaders out of others within the group as well, um, and uh, try and pick out those people uh, when you run in that session. If you have got high numbers and you can't do it all on your own, try and pick out those people that have natural leadership skills um, and give them that responsibility for that evening. You know, say, okay, I, I know you're one of our better players, but it would be really fantastic if you could take that group off and and do this fielding drill or this combination of fielding drills with them. That 
that would be a, a huge asset. And then as well as developing the, the cricketer, which you invariably you're going to do over the course of the, the six months that you work with them, you're also developing those leadership skills, which are absolutely crucial as those players go through into whatever cricket environments they end up in. And from the players' point of view as well, it's it's. I don't think there's too many coaches who, uh, if the if a player came up to them and said, "Can you, uh, can can I run a fielding drill, or you know, can I can I do a, ba- a batting practice with these f- five guys over here?" I don't think there's many coaches who would go, oh, "Do you know what? No, don't, don't worry about it." <laughs> I think most coaches would would be happy if they feel like the person can do it. That. Uh, for them to take the lead on that particular area. So uh, I guess I'm saying if you're a player, don't be shy to do that either. It's, it, it's all right. The, the coach is not going to mind. Uh, we, we did a great thing this summer. We, uh, we had a huge number of under-14 kids this year, far more than our coaching provision could, could allow. So yeah. uh, I opened up the opportunity for our top team, the Mayors 11, who don't play on Saturdays. To, uh, to offer to coach and to run little mini games for the, for the guys that, and the girls who weren't uh, involved in fixtures on those days. And we were inundated with some of those uh, fellows. You know, we put it out there as an option and uh, we had a minimum of two people each week working with 20 kids, giving them a fantastic experience, but also developing their own uh, coaching and leadership skills within that as well. And, uh, you know, I was dead, dead pleased with the way that they went and they, they enjoyed it and gave us good feedback about their experience too. OK, let's wrap up this section with the yes-no round. That is three questions that can only be answered yes or no, no matter how much more the team wants to say. I've got the questions, so let's fire away. First question. Innovation beats tradition. Yes. Yes. Second question. Skill beats strength. Yes. yes. Third question. Bats are too big. No. No. <laughs> uh, it's time now for the mailbag on the Pitch Vision Cricket Show. That is a couple of questions that, is, that have been sent in by listeners to the show or maybe readers to the Pitch Vision website. And um, the best question of the week, after we've answered them, of course, the best question of the week uh, wins a prize, which is an online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. And um, you can send your questions into us by emailing coach at pitchvision.com. And there are other ways you can get in touch with us, which we'll tell you about towards the end of the show. Uh, but for now, let's go to the first question, uh, which has been sent in by AJ. Uh, and AJ has a simple question, but perhaps a, a complex answer. He says, my passion is cricket and I want to play cricket, but my parents don't allow me. What should I do now? Well, I think the starting point would be, as we talk about with all sort of conflict situations, is uh, a discussion and a discussion to find out from your parents what what their reservations are, what, what it is that makes them not want you to play cricket. And it could be that they have some very good reasons for that, uh, and only they will know, but that's got to be discussed. It could be that they're ignorant about the game, but they haven't had exposure to the game before, that they don't see it in a positive light that, that we see it in, and, and therefore we need to start what to find out where their uh, starting point, I suppose, is uh, around sport, around you know the inclusion within sport, the benefits of sport. So I would encourage, first and foremost, a, a pretty robust conversation, asking in, uh, to them to present their case forward of why. Um, and once we've got the whys, then we can have a look to, to see whether those whys are accurate, whether they're insurmountable, whether uh, there are some options to work around some of those whys um, in order to get the, the desired result that you want. You know, And uh, obviously we're going to be fairly comfortable to support you uh, here with, uh, with your um, dreams and intentions of playing the game. But um, more importantly, I think it's really key that your parents have their say in uh, the reasons why they, they aren't happy for you to play cricket as yet. Passion is a difficult thing, isn't it? Because passion uh, is it's something that you has a you've got that fire within you, and you you can't consider anything else because you've got this deep desire. 
Um, but yet passion is also something that doesn't pay the bills. So, you know, often parents uh, or look at the odds of you becoming a cricketer and then say, well, actually, you know, it'd be much better for you to go and get a degree and, and uh, f- forget about this, this dream you've got of uh, playing for your country because it's unlikely to happen. So, you know, it's playing the percentages, um, look, look to get an education and get a career and, uh, and, and all that stuff. And then, but it, it's, often it's, it's hard for especially generations to, to understand each other, isn't it? And that's where communication becomes key, key doesn't it, Labour's? Because if something like that is the reason, then it's very hard for one side to, to empathise with the other side, isn't it? And it, it, it becomes sort of, but, but you don't understand, and that comes from both sides. And, that, and when the argument is, but you don't understand, that becomes very tricky, doesn't it? Yeah, it is, it is, a, it is often a case of, of one not understanding the other and... and um... One one side thinking that, that that one thing's right and the other thinking that they're they're completely right as well and and um, as we know in so often in these cases it's it's not necessarily of one camp or the other camp it's a, it's a, it's a case of getting a balance between the two um, there's no reason if it was a as you said you alluded to um, it could be a career thing if it's a, if it's a career thing well the best way to um, to benefit someone around sort of stressful times is to give them something that's going to de-stress them. It could be that cricket's the thing that does that, or the best the best way to um, the best way to keep someone motivated again is to to give them a period of time away from their challenging situations that's a bit more relaxing. So finding something that's going to balance with um, the thing that potentially his parents do want want him to do is something that's going to be really valuable to to make that other area of, of his life which we were obviously not aware of a little bit more successful potentially by um by by giving him a bit more freedom a bit more enjoyment in in life and and obviously not putting him in a situation like he is now where he's was getting frustrated which we can all understand um i think there's two two ways to approach it the one one way would be to for us to say what what's the details what's the information what's the scenario and really get in depth into this as an individual case study the other way is to throw it back to AJ and, and say that you can remove the the key quite the key words from the statement and almost take take yourself away from your situation. And if you could say your passion is whatever it might be, your passion is um, is fast bowling. Your passion is golf. Or your passion is um, what's your passion, David? I don't know. Eating is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> so your passion, you could be your passion is eating meat, and my parents don't want me to. How how do what do I do? Just externalise yourself from the problem and look at it and say, well, if this was the problem, how would we approach it? Because almost doesn't really matter what the issue is it, in terms of how we approach it. Is it's what's the actual what's the balance of uh, balance between the two of you? The word that we're actually fighting over isn't that important in terms of working out how we approach it. it it's more more a case of how would I approach this situation if it wasn't me and if it wasn't something that I was so clouded about and so invested in that maybe I'm I become a little bit confused and you can you can do that just by removing that putting in someone else's shoes um, and it might give you a little bit more perspective on how you can logically work through this process and logically find a way to talk to them about it but obviously in your case as well knowing all the information it then gives you a chance to um, to think about how you can understand their side a little bit better which is going to be really important important for you then delivering your side of the um, argument and your justification for what you want to do which is play cricket which is hopefully in a few weeks time or a few months time whatever it is we'll hear, have an email back for you which says you are playing cricket which would be fantastic yeah that's great advice David. i think finding finding similarities if you feel like you're in a conflict with someone often you can t- you can assume that you're taking view X and the other side is taking view Y and never the twain shall meet. But often, there's far more similarities in what you want to achieve than there are differences. It's just there's minor things. And if you can find what those similarities are, you can often um, work towards a, sub- a solution that both uh, sides like. And uh, so if you start, as you say, Labors, if you start with, Looking at what you agree on, then often that that cuts out a lot of the um, it cuts out a lot of the stuff that you thought you disagreed on. You, you know what I mean? You think you disagree on everything, and actually you only disagree on two small things, and ninety yeah. percent of it's the same. 
I, I wonder what the parents' email would be. It would be something along the lines of um, my my son's uh, no sorry our, our passion as parents is for our son to da 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 yeah however he doesn't want to do it what should i do now so it'd be interesting for to put yourself in their shoes and think what what would yeah. their email be if they were sending in an email about the same situation and then that might give you a bit of perspective on where you are and where they are and and as you said it's not a com- it's, it's often not a complete conflict where you disagree with everything um it's going to be a, conf- a few strands probably of it, and and from there you'll find a middle ground, which hopefully will will be something you can uh, you can build on. Next question is from Isan, and Isan says, "I'm a left arm spinner, and I want to ask some advice on bowling over the wicket. I have a wide round arm action. If I had to pick a current international to compare with." It's Shakib Al Hassan. When I bowl round the wicket, I have no issues. In fact, I bowl well. The problem is bowling over the wicket. Whenever I bowl over the wicket, because my action is wide towards the left, I tend to fall onto the stumps while following through or lose my balance and collapse while delivering. When I try to open up my action, my line and length go all wrong. What advice can you give me? I want to stay round arm and wide. But how can I execute this successfully when coming over the wicket? Is there a particular way I should run in? Well, th- there's one word that, that sort of jumps out here. And obviously with that footage, it's really difficult to see whether this stands up. But the fact that you're going into the stumps from over, over the wicket tells me that you've got a fairly acute angle into your uh, delivery stride so the first word that I would say to you is straighter Um, now not everybody prefers to have a straight run up there's been lots of good spinners and lots of fantastic bowlers that have had angled approaches into the stumps and I'm not standing here and saying that everybody needs to uh, run in and bowl straight but the fact that you're following through uh, uh, and hitting the stumps um, uh, tells me that there's a, a misalignment with your target a little bit here and even the best bowlers if you think from a fast bowling perspective uh, Malcolm Marshall used to run in from an angle Ian both had a huge curve both of those got uh, over 300 wickets in, in test cricket and uh, were fairly useful um, and um, and equally you know we've seen a number of spinners uh, have an angled approach Abdul Qadir being one that had an angled approach in fact most spinners when I grew up watching television had angled approaches to their run-ups John Embry and Phil Edmonds were the two best spinners uh, whilst I was very very little watching uh, the game on the box and, and they both came in from acute angles but what they did do was make sure that their their whole lineup was going towards their target right at the end so if you do prefer to come in on an angle then try and make sure that your last stride and particularly your delivery stride is uh, going towards your target from over the wicket so that would be my first thing for countering over the wicket is maybe experiment with slightly straighter run up or be more aware of the angle of your run up when you're uh, coming into bowl from over the wicket the second one is if it's that much of a problem and you are such a good bowler from around the wicket which sounds like you've got amazing control and you're happy from around the wicket is just try and play around with that and stay stay that side of a wicket when you're bowling to everybody Obviously, it's a natural angle for right-handers, right-handed batters, um, but it's an underrated angle for left-handed batters as well because the benefit of it, similarly to a uh, off-spinner bowling around the wicket to uh, a right-hander, is the fact that you can beat both sides of a bat from the same angle. You know, if a ball grips, it can go on the inside and bring LBW and bowl into play, and if a ball runs on with the arm, uh, then we can see that ball going across and taking the outside edge, bringing the keeper into play, or a slip, which you often see when people are bowling across the line of a bat face. So, um, you know, there might not be a need to change. It might just be that you say to yourself, right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bowl around the wicket to everybody. I'm going to master the different lines that I need to bowl, uh, to left-handers in particular. 
on different pitches, some at grip and some at don't. Um, and away you go. So, you know, what this, and the other question is, because you've sort of modelled yourself or you bowl similarly to Saqib, what does he do? You know, how does he go about it? Have a look at some video footage of him bowling and seeing how he manages himself, bearing in mind that you liken your bowling action to, to his. Uh, often copying is a really good way of uh, exploring some areas to, to uh, develop within your own game. Have you ever seen this problem firsthand, Lavers? Oh yeah, I think um, having having guys operate with an angle, which which can work very successfully, is also potentially um, a bit of a hazard. And, and I can understand where he's coming from. Um, one of the key things I, I, I would point out with a, a performer of, of his level or of uh, let me think, an, an Imran Tahir's level. I'm just thinking of current guys who work on a on a, on a quite a, quite an acute angle. Um, would be that you've got to remember they're also professional athletes, these guys. So, yes, they're working with what technically looks like a similar action to you, but it might be that the tools that they have that are allowing them to do that. Um, so physically, they might have a, a strength um, that allows for a change of direction whilst maintaining balance because they've worked at it and because they've really thought about or they've really they've had someone who's really considered how how strong they need to be to, to make that kind of change of direction whilst maintaining balance and, and whilst um, delivering a ball. So there's probably a little bit more to it sometimes than, than just the technical side. But as we've seen, the technical side isn't the, the, the be-all and end-all. Um, you can be different. You can do things different ways. But sometimes you just have to learn how to cope with that and how to manage that. Um, uh, Garras would probably have a better idea on, on Saqib, but... I would imagine he's um, physically probably in pretty good shape, and and core strength wise, he's probably um, he's probably pretty strong, and he's obviously very very um, very well trained in in the action he's got. So it might be that the the level of repetition and the and the, and the physical work that's gone alongside that has has allowed him to create the alignment he wants from the angle, which probably doesn't promote that initially, um, and then same for him to here as well. Um, who I know hasn't been the best over the years sometimes with his uh, SNC work, but but again he's um, he's strong enough to to make that ad- uh, adaptation in in change of direction when he's when he's coming into bowl and subsequently he does um, he does line up well enough that he can control his his body position and he control exactly what he's doing when he gets to the point of cre- point in the crease. So away from the technical side of things, there might be a physical element you can consider that that will help you in in doing what you do and, and it sounds like pretty successfully a lot of the time so um, yeah it might be something away from the, the technical side to think about uh, time now for 60 seconds of uninterrupted chat from one of the members of the team it's the soapbox and this week it's Mark Garraway so Garris over to you well, this week it's about resilience and it's about uh, early diversification in sports. And something, uh, resilience is to me the most important uh, capacity to have from a mental toughness point of view. And it often comes from people's ability to bounce back from disappointment. Um, and there's a lad that's been selected for England the 19s this week. He's uh, got a full time contract with Gloucestershire. Uh, fantastic cricketer, but somebody who's had a number of knockbacks throughout his career and bounced back back magnificently. He was also a multi-sports player, so came in as an all-rounder, scholarship, uh, rugby player, footballer, cricketer, probably in that order or something like that, um, and yet has found his way in cricket very late um, and achieved real good things in the last couple of years after being told he wasn't good enough by a county and told that he wasn't good enough by several coaches. He's bounced back and will make his debut in a couple of weeks. So resilience and early diversification. If you can take George Hankins lead on that one and he won't go too far wrong. And that is the end of the show for another week. We are about to leave you but before we do that we need to decide on the winner of this week's competition which is of course the online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com and so the questions on offer this week were AJ's question about his passion versus his parents and uh, Ishan's question about 
is slow left arm spin bowling. Which one did you prefer this week, Garris? I'm going to go with Sam's uh, question this week. Um, very interesting uh, set of circumstances. Uh, the option between staying around the wicket and mastering around the wicket to both right and left handers uh, versus uh, the ability maybe to straighten up the run up slightly or at least be more aware of their delivery stride like an Imran to here, like a Shaqib uh, does. So uh, maybe there's a course in there that help you out with that. Fantastic. Hopefully it can. And uh, yeah, interesting question about, you know, what playing to your strengths or um, you know trying to Im improve your skills improve your range of things so you know how you spend that time and and that kind of experimentation versus nailing what you can already do that's always interesting isn't it uh, now if someone Gareth was listening to the show and they thought that they want to have their question answered and also have their chance to win the prize how could they get in touch with us they could give us a call on 0203 239 7543 or drop us an email on coach at pitchvision.com. That's right. You can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash pitchvisionacademy. And our Twitter is at pitchvisionacad. If you want to listen to the show every week, that's pretty easy to do. Just go to your favourite podcast app. Click on to uh, the search box and do a search for Pitch Vision Academy. And then there's a subscribe button there, which you can, you can tap on there. And um, whichever app you use, you'll get that free uh, to your device. If you want to get the shows in a more manual way or you want to stream them from the website, you want to download them, then you get the show notes, then you can go to pitchvision.com slash academy and click on the podcast link for all the details there. That's all for this week. We hope you listen next week. But until then, have a good week. Cheers, Gareth. Cheers, Lavis. Cheers, guys. Cheers, fellas.